So today my intention is to give an introduction to bioenergetic pulsation. Now in a previous video I talked about how everything in the organic world pulsates. Uh, well, obviously we pulsate, our heart has a pulse, right? You got a pulse, it pulsates. But even things like the seasons, it's sort of a pulsation. I mentioned if I look out at this tree right now, uh, in the winter time, there will be a contraction. In the springtime, there's an expansion. So there's an expansion and contraction of even the plants around us. Everything in the world is at some rate doing this, right? This is, this is very evident just by observation. Uh, even my breathing, while we're breathing, there's an inhalation and there's an exhalation. So there's just, just this going on. And so we're gonna bring that down into what's really important for us in terms of bioenergetics because we wanna know how that pulsation, number one, affects our body in an acute way. We're gonna talk about that, right? Like uh, the expansion and contraction that happens when we meet a threat or we are in the throes of a pleasurable experience with somebody. The body changes, the body changes, and it has a lot to do with what that pulsation is doing. But also, and this is where we start moving in towards bioenergetic fitness and what I really wanna teach in these lessons, um, where the body then starts taking the shape of the predominant pulsation. And at a later date, I'll give you the history behind where these ideas come from and how they relate to uh, the realm of body psychology, the pioneers of this. Um, but for today and for the majority of this series, it, I want to be very practical for you guys. I want to bring this to a, uh, a level of utility. And before I proceed in that fashion, uh, and of course, you know, I got to start somewhere, I've noticed some comments, people are like, hey, Elliot, just tell us what to do. Just give us the stuff. Now, if you've been a fan of my videos for some time, I've been on YouTube since 2007, I started talking about bioenergetics around 2012. And a younger version of me, that's over 10 years ago, wanted to just give you all the stuff. I just wanted to give it all to you. And if you notice, there are a lot of videos, if you search bioenergetics, Elliot Hulse, you'll find me doing lots of weird things. The young, excited Elliot wanted to give it all to you with very little context. I even had to go back later on and start like catching up and, and explaining and trying to give context uh, because, well, of course, when you do eccentric, weird, wild things that most people don't know, understand about, you're gonna catch ridicule. And so, you know, I, <laughs> I'm kind of courageous and I'm, a, and I'm kind of stupid in a lot of ways. So, especially, you know, younger me. So I just threw it all out there and just dealt with the consequences. I'm slowing down now. And so I'm going to give you exercises. I'm gonna give you things to do. I'm gonna make this series, this YouTube channel complete with everything that you need to know. I plan on holding nothing back, but there has to be context. Otherwise I'll be taken for a fool. I don't mind being taken for a fool, by the way but you're not gonna be able to receive what I'm saying if you just see me doing crazy stuff. Because some of this stuff is a little crazy. Being a human being's crazy. Having emotions is crazy. Having a body is crazy. And so because we live in such a, a head-focused world, uh, anything that is awkward or odd that's related to body and breathing because it's sexual is people are afraid of. And people are afraid of emotions. So I have to take that into consideration and I hope you can take that into consideration and I hope that you're patient enough and curious enough to stick with me as I work through the theory of bioenergetic fitness and then the application of bioenergetic fitness. And, you know, I thought of creating a... a, a a table of contents, an outline, a syllabus for what I'm doing here, but I think it's better if I sort of dance between the two. And I'll give you a little bit of this, and I'll give you a little bit of that, but this, this topic, as I, when I started this series, is so expansive, and the way I think of it and see it is even more expansive, wilder, bigger, 
and more all-encompassing than even Wilhelm Reich. And he's, he, you know, I mentioned that I'll be talking about the history, but just so you know, a lot of these ideas in the West come from Wilhelm Reich. Brilliant, crazy, mad scientist that was, that died in prison because, you know, these ideas will drive you crazy, especially in a world that doesn't know how to receive them. But I'm taking the risk of being even crazier. The only difference is I'm not practicing medicine. I don't claim to practice medicine. And part of the problem was that he got in trouble with the FDA. Um, I'm not practicing medicine. I am a fitness coach and you can't deal with the body if you're, if you're in the muscular system uh, without taking into consideration the nervous system. And you can't take into consideration the nervous system, right, which moves all these bones and muscles uh, without taking into consideration the mind, the brain, well, the brain. You can't, you have to take into consideration the brain, right? I'm going to be teaching someone how to make the best of their body. Well, what controls that body? The brain. And what is the function of the brain? Well, Thoughts, feelings, movement. So, you know, I plan on just dumping it all out there, sorting it out, trying to make sense of it, delivering it to you, and we'll see where it goes. Got that, bro? Let's go. So, bioenergetic pulsation. So when I use the word bioenergetic, I'm talking about how it relates to human beings in a fitness context. Wilhelm Reich saw it as the ether. He, he asserted, and he did scientific studies, and he was kind of onto something uh, when he said that the whole world is, swims in a sea of this pulsating energy he called orgone. And so this is where a lot of people, he lost a lot of people. They were like, you're crazy. Um, he's on to something, but I, we don't even need to go there. I'm not interested in going there, right? If you look up Wilhelm Wright cloud busters, he was using this stuff to like create rain. Like he, he had an instrument that like manipulated orgone or like this energy, right? And, and I use the word energy and I always want to point back to the Christian context of energy. This is not some woo woo new age idea. The energies of God, it's how we experience the seat of creation, energy. We will never know his essence, but we know him through his energy. So when I'm talking about energy, I'm talking about the, the animating force of the universe. It's whatever you want to call it, it's here. And we know it's here. We're going to talk about it in a scientific way today, which I think is going to be a lot of fun for you guys. So pulsation, right? Wave signs, right? In, in, Love dub, uh, you know, night day, just these this this contrast. Well, the way it's experienced in the human person, in the human body, in the human experience is through expansion and contraction, right? And I'll just do something really simple. This is me expanding, this is me contracting. This is me expanding, this is me ex contracting. You see what I'm saying? So I could do it through my central nervous system, meaning my, my, my cognitive abilities, right? I'm doing, I'm acting it out, but also it happens at a involuntary way. There's voluntary and involuntary. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I just want you to understand that the, 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 everything that we're doing in some way, shape or form is mitigated and operates through this pulsation of expansion and contraction. Everything that I'm doing right here, right now is a byproduct of expansion and contraction or this, this, this dialectic, right? I can get crazy with this. I often talk about how the computer screen that you're watching me through is just a series of zeros and ones, right? Which, what is it? Like ones, like you can think of this as like a expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction, right? Everything, everything's just doing that. And um, I'll leave it at that. But in the human body, we experience it as expansion and contraction. If you lift, what are you doing? You're contracting, expanding, contracting, expanding. So we're going to talk for a moment because we have to take consideration that we have voluntary and involuntary expansion and contraction. That's really important as it relates to what your muscular system ends up looking like. Boom. This is where we start bridging the gap to fitness and exercise, training, posture, muscle, right? 
And so we have to take into consideration that, well, yeah, you're, when you're training in the gym, you're, 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 you're consciously pumping, but you're also unconsciously pumping. What's pumping? What's actually being pumped? When we talk about pump, even when you're in the gym and you say, oh, I got a good pump. Just think about a pump. What does a pump do? Pump. What's actually being pumped is what we would call plasma. Plasma is like the liquid. It's your blood. It's the liquid portion of your blood. So your blood has, you know, cells, red blood cells, but it also has liquid. I believe there's about five liters worth of this liquid in your body, right? This is, this is a liter and a half. So three of these, you got three of these. This is, that's pretty big, a, a plasma in your body. This plasma, it, it distributes nutrition, hormones, blood cells. It's moving stuff around your body. It's just moving stuff around your body. In fact, in the, in, in the Old Testament, they believed that the blood was the life force. Even in, in the Bible altogether, you know, that's why Christians often talk about the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the life force of Jesus, the plasma of Jesus. This stuff is actually really important. We take it for granted, oh, there's blood, right? And so we watch like horror movies, or we, we live in a violent society where blood's just splattering all over the place. But there was a time when we considered our blood to be very, very sacred. And I almost went and said that, oh, you know, it was only in the Old Testament um, where they referred to it as like the life force, your life force. But it right up through, you know, we live in AD, Adnum Deum, the day of our Lord. Right now, there's great consideration for blood because blood is, is I guess you could say the the emanation or, or it is the physical expression of what's happening in the life force, which pulsates. Let's come back down to earth. So we're filled with about 80% of this plasma. And the thing is with this plasma is that it's constantly either expanding towards the surface of the skin or it's retreating. It happens on the surface and it happens deep inside as well. So what are some examples? So, well, if you're a man and you're watching this and you become aroused by your wife, what happens? There's an expansion. And on her end of the spectrum, there's also an expansion, right? Right, you know, I'm going there with the sexuality, but that's, the, and what is, what, is, what is the plasma doing? What is the, what is the blood doing? It's reaching out. It's reaching out. So your body is reaching for your woman. And your woman is expanding to receive you. You see what I'm saying? So that's, and that is totally involuntary. That's, that's, you're not, you and your woman aren't saying, okay, time to go. Hey, turn it on. It's like, it's just happening. You could, you have no control over it sometimes. I was like, hey, I don't even, you know, I don't know what's going on here. This thing is just expanding, right? And then sometimes you want it to expand and it doesn't expand and you're like, come on, go, go. And I don't want to do it. It's completely, completely involuntary. Other exp expressions of this is, so when you blush, if, if, if somebody embarrasses you, right? You stand up in the middle of class and uh, as you're giving a speech, you fart. And everybody starts going, Ooh. plasma, right, which carries red blood cells, will fill your face up, and you start, you get hot face, red faced. That's the plasma expanding into your head, right? Right. Um, another one that's associated with reaching out. The lips, when you're, you know, a lot of it is sexual. A lot of this is sexual, so I have to go there because this is how we experience it. We experience it mostly through, through sensation. And so if you're in a warm embrace with your woman, the lips actually will turn red. Her lips will turn red. You'll notice that the mouth is, becomes more red. The tongue actually gets thicker and redder. And also because the, you, we reach out, the first thing that we started reaching out with as a baby, because this has a lot to do with human development, Babies, their first means of reaching out is 
right? Because they're, it's so funny when my children were babies, my mom, their mom would hold them and they'd be like, all they could move is their head and their mouth. And they're like, and they look crazy doing this. Well, what are they doing? They're looking to latch on to their mother. They're looking for life. So when we're kissing somebody, it's, like, it's very oral, meaning like it goes back to, it's a developmental stage where we're like, we're trying to reach out with the most primal part of our reaching out organs, which is our mouth. But also the fingers, you might notice that the fingertips underneath the nails, they start turning red because like now I'm, re I'm, t I'm holding my lover, I'm touching my lover, and my hands on my lover. The hands fill with plasma. The hands might even look bigger. Pay attention, notice. Interesting note, <laughs> so women wear red lipstick and red fingernails, especially when it's red, that is a primordial sign of sexual readiness. And it comes from, if you will, our primate instinct, primate ancestry, if you will, All right? There's a, bit, there's a bit of that prime, we are primates, but there's a bit of that what happens with apes that happens with us too. Not saying we came from apes, I'm not sure that's true, but we, we're cousins. And the female, <laughs> the female will fill up, of course, you know, if you ever see like baboons, like, you know, the, the whole backside will turn red, meaning like, yo, come and get it. Um, but also their lips will turn red and they, like, you know, they got bigger lips. The whole lips will turn red and the fingernails will turn red. So next time you see your girl getting dressed up, going out and she's putting red fingernail stuff on and, and red lipstick, you say, hey, who are you getting ready for? You're trying to look ready. <laughs> Maybe she's trying to get ready for you, but it's, but it's play. It's make believe I'm ready for you, right? Just, you know, that's what the, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's a, it's a mock-up of what happens to the plasma in the body. It's moving out. So that is an expansion of plasma. And the, and the plasma, like you just noticed, will expand in different areas. It'll expand down here, expand up here. Right? To, mostly it expands to the most sensitive parts of the body. Mouth, right, head, hands, genitals, feet. Right? So here, 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 here. The five points the five points that makes a human being. That's where it'll expand. Also, it's where it will contract. Somebody you know who has really cold and lifeless hands or a cold, lifeless face or impotent genitalia, you see what I'm saying? Cold sexually, all these things. So that what you would call contraction. That's why I have it in blue. So that pulsation is a matter of the physical body, the muscular system, the blood, the plasma, either expanding or contracting. And you could see that the, if this is happening throughout our entire body, it really not only indicates our experience, but it also colors our experience. If you're trying to be intimate with your lover, but there's no expansion going on because your autonomic nervous system is just not keyed up for it, for whatever reason, it's gonna color your experience. If you, are, if you have stage fright, what is fright? Fright is a contraction. So if you're trying to get up on stage and maybe you want to, you know, give a presentation or you're whatever, right? You're going to be in front of a lot of people and you go into contraction, uh, 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 you're going to choke. Think about what choking is. Your throat has to contract. So you go into a contraction. So it's going to color your experience. What's happening pulsation wise dictates a whole lot. It's the life force moving through you. It's the energies of God moving through you, whatever you want to call it. They've got all kinds of scientific names and Neo-Jungian names, all kinds of stuff. I just call it God, right? Of course, language, ass. So plasma. Now what dictates this moving out or moving in that's associated with what we're experiencing or what we choose? Well, there's two, there's two, there's two, there are two branches of the nervous system that we need to consider. The, cebra, the cerebral spinal situation, right? The brain and the nervous system, the peripheral nervous system. So we've got the central nervous system, right? Which is the brain, the top brain, you know, the, the cortex, neocortex, the brain stem, and then all of the little branches that go out, afferent and efferent nerves, that dictates, that, that gives us the capacity to consciously control how we, what we do, right? I can consciously choose to go and chase that thing. Oh, well, you know, if I'm a hunter 
and I and there's a you know I'm hunter and gather society or whatever. I see there's a deer over there. Well, I grab my spear and I, now I'm going. I'm expanding towards it. I want that thing. I want that thing. I'm gonna go get it. If a bear comes out of the bush, what am I gonna do? Whoa! A little bit, little bit of this is autonomic, but I know that bear's gonna f me up. Ah, uh, back up, back up. Maybe more a matter of like you see the bear, you're like, oh, oh, I don't want that bear to see me. You start creeping backwards. You see what I'm saying? So that's expansion or contraction based on the central nervous system, right? Now, the peripheral nervous system is really interesting. So the central nervous system, you call it the central nervous system because it's mostly here, right? But, you know, I, I, it's tough because we use language to describe things as they're separate, but it's all really one thing. But the language helps us differentiate. So, you know, this is all one thing. This is all one thing. All these nerves are all connected. But they operate slightly differently, especially as it relates to the difference between what's going on down here and what's up here. This is where the sun rises, our solar plexus, our diaphragm that helps us breathe. I'm gonna talk about breathing because breathing has a whole lot to do with this. Super important. But a lot of what we, we can call the autonomic nervous system happens in the organs, right? The organs, and it's involuntary. So the peripheral nervous system innervates these organs that do things without our awareness. So for example, as I walk closer to this light, my, my eyes constrict, the little, the little uh, I forget what you call them, but my pupils dilate or they get smaller, they contract. As I get back into the dark, they'll expand. So that's a contraction and an expansion of my eye muscles that I'm not thinking about. I'm not trying to make that happen. That's the autonomic nervous system, ANS, autonomic nervous system. My heart, if I'm being chased, bloop, 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 that's go, heart rate's gonna go up, that's expansion. If I'm hiding because I don't wanna be found, my heart rate might go down, maybe not. But you get the point, your body is doing things that you're not thinking about, right? In fact, when it comes to the contraction and expansion, that autonomic nervous system that controls our involuntary muscular movements, which you know, I think you would say that a lot of it is, it controls the, the, the smooth muscle, smooth muscle, where this is like controlling the striated muscle, smooth muscle, like organs. Like, you're, like you're, 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 if you ate something, your stomach's doing a bunch of stuff. You're not thinking about it. That's a smooth muscle, involuntary, doing what it needs to do. But there are two branches of the autonomic nervous system that we need to pay very close attention to because th they're linked to a control lever that we have that will determine our experience of pulsation. We actually have conscious control in a, in a, in a very real way to the autonomic nervous system. If your autonomic nervous system is running on total automatic, you could be stressed out. You could... The beautiful thing about being a human being is that we can be conscious about what's happening involuntarily. Not all of it, but a lot of it. Like, you know, these guys like the Shaolin monks, you know, who like, or even like Wim Hof, people that do Wim Hof stuff, where they're like sitting in the cold. You can control your heartbeat. These guys, I've heard studies with like these, uh, these crazy like Chinese monks or something, where they will sit in freezing cold and they will, make, they will control their autonomic nervous system to such a degree that they'll melt all the snow around them. And you go over to them and touch them and they're hot. That's mastery. <laughs> We're not even going there. But it just shows you that what's possible, right? This is powerful stuff. So you got the, you got the two branches of the autonomic nervous system. You got the parasympathetic branch and the, and, the, and the sympathetic branch. Just think about it this way. Parasympathetic is rest and digest when you're relaxed, right? When you're relaxed. And, and sympathetic is when you're stressed. So for example, we were talking about boners before, right? I gotta go there because it's, 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 it's so obvious and evident, right? And it's important. So when you're relaxed and aroused, boner comes easy. 
when you want to be aroused, but you're not, but you're not relaxed, you can't do it. Sympathetic. You're under stress. Now, if you know that you're under stress, then maybe you take a hot shower, drink some chamomile tea, lay down and do some breathing exercises. Next thing you know, here I go, bro. Boner comes home. And so we, we have some control over that. But the main, the main mechanism that really separates us from the animals, man, it's pretty amazing, is our second brain. Have you ever heard someone say that the stomach is the second brain? It's so funny because it's like right between the stomach and between the heart, there's the rising sun. We rise up out of the darkness of our belly and balls into the awakening of our heart and our conscious mind. It's very, the body is so poetic. It's so fascinating. There's so much symbol and association that I could get, I could start getting crazy. I, I will get crazy, but just not today because I want to keep this focus. So autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic, sympathetic nervous system, it's going to affect your breathing and your breathing can affect it. Super important to understand. Now, generally speaking, you've got three experiences that you can have. That's associated with your, perce your perception and your experience of your environment, both internally and externally, right? So what's going to determine what happens inside your body? We call these feeling pairs. These feeling pairs are associated with contraction and expansion. Contraction and expansion. When you are fearful, you're in a contracted state. I'm going to show you what it means for your breathing in a moment. When you are angry, you're in a contracted state. When you're in pain, you're in a contracted state. I'm going to show you physically, and we could even go into the physiology, but not today, but physically what that looks like. But the opposite of fear is trust. When you trust, you ever do those trust exercises? It means that you just let go and you let somebody like catch you. You got to be pretty relaxed. You can't be contracted. You ever see somebody try to do the trust exercise? Not only do they hesitate, but once they, once they fall back, they like start reaching out and they're like, ah! They're, 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 they're not trusting. They're not relaxed. They're still in fear, which is a contracted state. It's a contracted state mentally. It's a mental contraction. And it's a physical contraction. It's all one thing. You're thinking contracted thoughts. You ever hear somebody say, think abundant thoughts? What is thinking about abundant? Boom, 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 ah! You ever hear somebody say impoverished? Mm. Little. You can be in an impoverished mindset, which is a contracted mindset, or you could be in an abundant mindset. You see how this is? Anger, contraction. Contracted, right? Love, right? Pain, pleasure. You see? So contraction and expansion. Fear, trust. It's all there. But now we're talking about the breath, which, is, which is, is, the, is how we can work with these things first by assessing what's going on and then also mitigating it. You could be in a situation, like so for example, with regard to fear, I was, I don't know where I heard this story, but it's, you know, it's a made up story. But like if you're in a coffee shop, right, just a bunch of people in a coffee shop, I think it was, I don't know, something I heard or saw on TV or whatever. But it's, you'll see it in the movies all the time. And a gunman bursts in. Bang! Everybody freeze! Almost everybody's going to get, they're, they're going to go right into that contraction. Boom! But if you got like a former Navy SEAL in there or a special operations guy, somebody who's very skilled in martial arts and, and, uh, and uh, situational awareness, right? I got some friends like that. I would love to be in a situation like that with them. Me, I'm not so sure because I haven't practiced that. But because they practice this, they immediately go into a sort of a trust. They're, they're relaxed. They're like, boom, okay, the guy comes in. They may get a shock at first, but next thing you know, they go, <sighs> they're breathing different than everybody else. The first thing that you'll notice physiologically, whether they're aware of it or not, is that their breathing's more relaxed. And then they start scanning. I start looking around. 
And then they, you know, they start making moves about what they need to do. Run, run, cover, run, cover, run. I don't, I don't know. I've learned these from my friends, but I've never been in situations. So I don't remember it because I'd freak out. Right? I'm not prepared for that. So, but if you're prepared for it, you trust. You trust yourself. You trust the situation. You're relaxing. You're cool. But everybody else, now catch this because this is important, is the acute expression of each one of these feeling pairs in their contracted state. Because contraction can become chronic, and that's where we're going to be going with this. It's very important. We got to recognize that our body then starts taking the form of our chronic feeling pair or our cro chronic contraction. We have chronic contractions. Or what I used to call in my videos that I'm bringing back right now is neurotic holding patterns. Neurotic holding patterns. You have holding patterns all across yourself here that you're not even aware of. And that's just some of them. Wilhelm Reich said that there were seven, but they're all over. They're all over. But there are bands of muscular tension. And if you look at like fascia, just look at a, a you know, I have this book about fascia, The Endless Web. Let's see if I can pull the picture up really quickly. You will notice that there are these bands of fascia that wrap around the body at these segments. That's some of the segments anyway, right? Around the eyes, around the jaw, around the throat, around the heart. There are more. Here they've got what, seven? Yeah, seven. Right? That's, that's generally speaking. So this is not, this is not, you know, hokey, pokey, woo-woo chakra stuff. Although there's some truth to the chakra stuff. Um, this is just, this is just science. This is just a book. This is a book about facial anatomy. It's just facial anatomy, right? Fashion anatomy and physical reality. It's reality. It's real, right? So you call it whatever you want. This is how the body's made. We're made in the likeness and image of God. No wonder there's seven, right? That's the, that's the number of the divine. Anyway, I don't want to go there right now. So this is important. We got expansion and contraction. And, it, and so here's what the breathing looks like. And remember, I just want to tie this back to fitness because if you're breathing this way, your performance will struggle. And, this, and, and I'm going to make a very good statement here in a moment. But don't think that just because you're not in acute fear that you're not trapped in chronic fear. Just think as you're not experiencing this thing consciously right now, that it's not evident in your, well, breathing. So a fear breath is a quick, short, shallow breath and a hold in. So if somebody jumps out from behind a bush and, and goes, boo, you know what you're going to do? <gasps> it's a quick, short in breath and a hold. That can become chronic. People who have really short in-breaths, they're not taking that stuff in, that good stuff in, and it shows up in the body. The body starts to hold that contraction by having either a shallow or a rigid torso, contracted belly. A lot of people, you can, cre you can, create, you can create emotion in your body, by, in, in, your, in your experience, by what you do with your body. People who have, in the fitness industry, who have like a lot really tight bellies, first of all, a lot of them, like their bellies are that tight because they got neur neurotic holding patterns. So it's like, hey, you got abs, but they're not very healthy. They don't know how to let their belly relax. Just because you have abs doesn't mean you're healthy. Ha! Your breathing is, that just looks like, it's a lot of times it looks like that's just a person trapped in a fear character structure. We'll talk about character structure later. That person, you know, that's a, that's a fear type right there, right? Just because he's got a small waist and... And, and chiseled abs, right? That could be an indication of pathology, right? Not always, but it could be. Quick breath, hold. Uh, anger, big breath in, hold. So if you're angry, right? I'm, uh, I, I kind of lean towards this type. What do we do? Right? So as opposed to, Right? What is somebody who's angry? You just you know you're angry because you do that. You go, All right? Like I'm gonna, right. and then that person like you could even see them puff up. Like you know, watch two guys in a bar fight. <laughs> watch two guys like getting in it, getting in it at a you know at a at a game or something. You'll just watch them do this. They balloon up. 
they take a big breath, balloon up. I mean, you even see this in nature, like you see the cobra. You look at my, my dogs when they start fighting with each other or if they're like really spooked out, their whole neck goes, right? There's an expansion up top that's associated with, I'm either really angry or I'm making myself look angry so you don't mess with me, right? Big breath in and hold, right? Just think about pulsation. If a pulsation is supposed to be smooth and yours is like stuck, or if it's like stuck, right? It's like fear. This is like anger, right? And you could have a very herky-jerky pulsation and you could have a really uncomfortable body and a very uncomfortable life. Most of us do, unconsciously, we don't realize. Part of the reason why you feel like shit all the time because your pulsation is jacked up because you got trapped emotions, you're in our out of holding patterns. And then you also have the pain, the pain breath. And the pain breath, so you would think like, okay, so you got the quick hold, you also have the hold, but the pain, the best way to describe it, it's stuck. And I've heard people use this, because I've taken classes on this stuff, and like, you know, there's the language that's used often, and they say stuck. But there's a, there's a, there's a term that people use now, <laughs> It's kind of an older term, but like people will say it, they know what you mean when you say cringe. Think about what happens when you cringe. Ugh. You s literally stop breathing. You, you contract, but you also, ugh, you, it, it's the weirdest thing, because a cringe, uh, it's an it's a out breath, but it's also a contraction. So it's, you're stuck. When you cringe, it means you, you're, you don't know what to do. You're stuck. It's like, am I contracting or am I breathing out? Ew. Ew. Right? When you're in pain, ah, ah, you let out. It's an out breath, but it's also a contraction. So it's a weird place to be. But pleasure and pain. When you're in pleasure, ah, right? You let go and you, and you expand. Your muscular system expands. So... That's the cute experience, and I gave ample examples of what that looks in an acute way. But we're going to get into, and I just gave a few small examples here, we're going to get into the chronic holding patterns that are associated with it. And some of these terms you're going to be familiar with, because if, if you're following me for fitness, you know that there's an ectomorph, an endomorph, and a mesomorph. I got three types here that you could describe as ectomorph, endomorph, and mesomorph based on these. So if you're, and listen, somebody said, oh, this is Elliot's pseudoscience again. Yeah, pseudo meaning, meaning like it's, it's fuzzy. Yeah, it's fuzzy science. A lot of this, I mean, a lot of stuff is fuzzy, right? A lot of the things we take for granted are fuzzy. This is fuzzy. Is it a matter of genetics or experience? Is it, is it nature or nurture? And then you have this whole realm of science called epigenetics. So as pseudo as it is, there's a whole lot of scientific studies and evidence that suggests and supports all the crazy stuff I'm talking about here. Gaber Mate is one guy who's a very well-respected uh, MD. Also Bruce Lipton, who's a very well-respected MD. Uh, a lot of these guys, you know, they struggle because they don't, they, you, could, you could be taken seriously by keeping yourself really rigid or you could be seen as a hippie by just letting yourself free flow with these ideas. And, the t you know, and so it's like Sigmund Freud, I got to go there because it explains the two different types that I'm work that I love. Sigmund Freud was the guy that tried to make all this fuzzy stuff really medical. Psychology is pseudoscience. It, 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 it leans towards religion. And in religion, you got, you, got, you got spirit and you got body. You got some disembodied religions and you got some spiritless religions. But the whole idea is that, that's it, religion. What does the word religion mean? It means to reunite, to re-league, right? And it's spirit and body, right? God became man. He re-leagued, right? So on one end of the spectrum, you have... Carl Jung, these are, I'm big, this is, these are my two favorite people when it comes to learning this stuff. Carl Jung, real spiritual, scientific in a spiritual way. That's why he's an amazing, brilliant man. Same thing with Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich, very scientific, like he wanted to measure everything. 
but he's trying to measure spirit in the body. It's crazy. And both of them are considered like in the psychoanalytic community. I don't know. I'm not a part of it, but just talking to people, and listening to people. Uh, both of them are considered quacks. You can't, you can't be taken seriously in like the light field or licensed psychology or whatever. And, or maybe more these days, but like when they were around, they were way ahead of their time. These guys are considered pseudoscientists. So I'm not put off by that term. You say, oh, well, he does pseudoscience. Oh, yeah, well, big deal. Call it whatever you want. It works, right? It's true. Whether it's pseudoscience or not, maybe you can't measure it with tools, but in a way you can. Just look at those two guys. Anyway. Energy creates the body. The body reinforces the energy. What you do with your body or what's happening in your body creates the body. The pattern affects the matter. The pattern affects the matter. The pattern is in the matter. The father is in the mother. God became man. We have the image of God as physical beings on us. I mean, I don't know how else you was. There's a lot of different ways to say it. But the energy creates the body. So many different examples I could use, but the energy creates the body. Thoughts become reality. I spoke about imagination the other day. But then reality reinforces the thought. Law of attraction. It not, it's not very mind-blowing, folks. It's not, that, it's not that hippie. It's actually biblical, right? You reap what you sow, right? If you sow thoughts of negativity, you experience negative feelings, you relate to the world in a negative way, you're going to get back that negativity. I don't have to be a genius to figure that one out. I think a lot of people are superstitious. <laughs> both ways. Both sides of the spectrum. I don't play either side of the spectrum. Conservative or liberal. You got a lot of Christians out there that they're superstitious. Thinking like, oh, that's, you can't do that stuff. What do you mean you can't do that stuff? You're doing it. They're superstitious about it. And then you got people on the other end of the spectrum who are like, everything is just going to come to me when I think about it. They're superstitious too. Both ends of the section, section are dumb. I'm trying to unite it. The middle road. Anyway. So, but it's, a, it's, take it or leave it. Energy creates the body. The body reinforces the energy. My character structure is evident through this camera. The way you receive me reinforces my sense of identity. And the way you, you show up at your workplace reinforces your identity. The body reinforces the energy. Then you have the thoughts that are associated with being that kind of person. That's why if you want to change your life, you got to change your body. And if you want to change your body, you got to change your mind. All one thing. So... I'm kind of, kind of running out of steam here, but I'm just going to show you these three types. Ectomorph, for you lifting types, mesomorph, endomorph. I'm not going to get into the energy dynamics that you see here, but the, the five-pointed star really represents the human being in the best way to, to demonstrate this. The head, the arms, the legs, the genitals. And what I tell you before about expansion and contraction. We're doing it through the five points. So you have people who have low charge. They're trapped on the inside. You got people who have high charge. And then you have people who are stuck charge. Right? And so low charge individuals tend to have long, thin, contracted bodies. High charge individuals tend to have built up upper bodies, very expressive up top, right? Oftentimes, not always, you know, good bodybuilders have good lower legs, you know, lower body, but a lot of the energy is drawn up from the, from the lower body and it goes this way. So you see it like that. And then you got, you got, the, you got the endomorph, which it sounds, think about the term endo. Ecto, outside is free. Ect, right? The, like the ecto, ecto, I don't know what else to say. But ecto, outside, endo, is like endo. So the energy, it, it's inside, and it can't get out, so the person is contracted this way. They're usually short and fat, right? Is it a chicken or is it an egg? Is it 
nature? Is it nurture? Who knows, but the, but what you can use this for is designing your exercise, nutrition, and lifestyle in such a way that it takes into consideration what your predominance is. And we all have some kind of predominance. Wilhelm Reich, God bless his heart, as, as with most geniuses, dare I say, they're usually very misunderstood, but they're usually also very willing to change their mind. And he was an atheist, militant atheist. And, I, and I'm, my heart is softening for him a lot more now as I've decided to delve back into him. But when I became a Catholic, um, I, I recognized the ill that he created in terms of perverting our society through a lot of the sexual revolution stuff. They call him the, the, the father of the sexual revolution. He hated God. He hated God, he hated Christianity, he hated Catholics in particular, and he wanted to pervert sexuality in, in the woman. He thought it was liberation, that's why it was called uh, the, the, you know, sexual liberation or revolution. But anyway, that was in his early years. As he started delving more into his scientific research of orgone, that's neither here nor there, there was a shift in him. And he wrote a book called The Murder of Christ. And I have yet to read it, but for what I understand, just, you know, second, secondary resources have said that Wilhelm Reich, towards the end of his life, started to develop a appreciation for, for Jesus Christ, calling him the fully orgastic man. Jesus Christ does not struggle with any of this. <laughs> he's the fully free man with no neurotic holding patterns. That's why he's the icon for the perfect man. No other religion has an icon for the perfect man. That's what makes Christianity different than every other religion. That God became incarnate as an icon or logos of the perfect man. And he lives within us, meaning we have the ability, we have the capacity. God wants to draw us into the arms of Christ, which means the fully orgastic, perfectly organized, integrated man. And that's what we're aiming for. That's what I'm aiming for. That's what I dream about. Being the strongest version of myself, that's why I'm interested in this kind of stuff, and then sharing it with you. So if you're still here, you're watching after almost 50 minutes, means you're, once again, a part of my soul tribe. You're one of those few people. I got a million, over a million subscribers on this YouTube channel. And of course, you know, I get like 0.07% subscriber rate uh, or view, but I don't care. I don't care. It doesn't matter. It's been a long time. God put me through a, a, a series of shadow encounters you know, with my own shadow to get me in this place where I can really just be this free and be that okay. Since I started making YouTube videos uh, three weeks ago, I've already lost 4,000 subscribers. I'm okay with that. I'm looking for you. I'm looking for the guy that's watching this right now. If you're watching this right now and you're going to take this ride with me, I'm going to give you everything I know, then that's where we're aiming. We're aiming to become like Christ. And that means a specific thing to me. That means becoming the fully orgastic, well-organized, integrated man, right? Do you have to be Christian to follow me, follow me on this? No, it would be helpful because there's a lot of stuff there that if you throw the baby out with the bathwater because you don't like Christians or you don't understand something that Christians do, which even I don't, what do you lose? especially when it comes to the Catholic faith. If you throw out all the sacraments, the sacredness of the imagery and the ceremony and the rituals and the, man, you, you, you throw a lot of stuff out that's good for our inner life. I don't agree with everything. I don't follow it blindly. I see what's useful and I get rid of the rest. Most people don't see anything useful because they don't want to and they throw it all away. So if you're willing to follow me because you think there might be something in here for you, I guarantee you, you're going to be in for a surprise. It's going to be great. Goodbye.